since local media organizations commenced publication of the leaked Pandora Papers. Former Governor Peter Obi has been hard-pressed to deny the revelations on his secret business dealings overseas. Like similar document leaks before it, the Pandora Papers have helped to expose the concealed fortunes in offshore tax havens, and in some cases, money laundering, by some of the most powerful people in the world. But in a statement, will be dismissed a report by Premium Times, which disclosed that the former governor had conceded a number of offshore businesses and investments when he was at the helm of affairs in Anambra State. According to Musikili Umajid, editor-in-chief of Premium Times, Obi may have violated the Code of Conduct Bureau and Tribunal Act by not declaring his or that of his family's beneficial ownership in the said assets. Majid, who was on the show last week, added that the former governor flouted the Nigerian constitution by operating a foreign bank account while in office and may have concealed his offshore investments to avoid tax. Well, in a time-honored tradition, of giving all sides a right of reply. We're now being joined by Peter B, former Anambra State Governor, to give us his side of the story on the allegations made against him by Premium Times. Good morning, Mr. B, and thank you for coming on the morning show. Good morning for inviting me. And well, good morning to the viewers. Well, the obvious uh, question to ask is, are you guilty as charged? because you were named in the latest scandal, Pandora Papers, as one of those involved in setting up a secret company for the purpose of money laundering, illegal purchase of properties overseas, while you were in office as governor of Anambra State. Well, thank you. Number one is that I'm not guilty. <laughs> Trust company is a legitimate vehicle used everywhere globally for investment, savings, and estate planning purposes. It's allowed by law everywhere. In my particular case and that of my family, it was done on very valuable advice of our then bankers, Lois TSB. This is what they did to all their international clients who operated at the time I lived in the UK, they will help you to see that you formulate a trust company offshore, and that is what we did. This company was never used to buy, to launder money before, during, and after till date. So it wasn't used any time there was an office for anything. Two, it was never used to buy property before I went into office, during the time I was in office, and after the time I was in office. It was strictly a trust company that savings and family planning that was strictly used to support our borrowings, which we even invested in this country. And they are facts. They are not uh, things that you can... That's it. Right. So... Well, according to confidential information, you have about half a billion dollars squirreled away in the British Virgin Islands and in Switzerland. Can this amount be described as legitimate earnings? Well, I wish, uh, I don't think I would even be here if I had that type of money. But let me tell you, you know when people bind the money, or we'll talk about money and size of money here, it's because we're not a productive country. People don't work for their money. So we find it difficult to understand value of money. And I'll take time to explain this to you. Globally today, the world population is 7, million, 7 billion, 750 million. Out of which, only 37.5 million is worth $1 million. That is 0.05%. Only 3 million which is 0.04% is worth 10 million. And only, and only 300,000 is worth $25 million, which is 0.004%. So when people call these figures, it's alarming because of the fact that we, we live in a country where people make money, they don't need and everything. If you go anywhere 
near this company being mentioned is that count everything globally and find more than about 3%, 3% of the value you mentioned now. 3%, I'm talking about $15 million, out of which 70% is being is supporting a loan of investment in this country, then confiscate everything. Even confiscate everything I have in my life. If you go to this, do you know what half a billion dollars is? Throughout half a billion dollars today in Nigeria is almost 300, 300 billion naira. My entire earning while I was governor, Anambra State received, was under 500 billion, out of which I say 15 percent, 75 billion. That is you're talking about. It's, it's, I don't know where, where people call figures here, yeah. and that's why people try to make money they don't need. What do you need that type of money for? Why do you have to do that? The money, the trust company is there. And one of the challenges I'm going to throw today is to ask you and some other people to select one, two, three, four persons that have food their bill to follow the trail of this company to where it is today. And see the formation, the ad, who gave the advice, how we came to it and everything. Please, there's nothing, you wouldn't even find 5% of that, of what the figure you called, anywhere. If I have $500 million, well, I, will, I don't know what I'll be doing. You would have seen me building, uni you know how many schools and institutions I support? I've been building universities all over the place. Let's talk about Next, Next International UK. They said you didn't resign as the director you know, of Next, and uh, 14 months after you became the governor. We're still director of Next. Tell us about this Next International Company. Let me tell you. Let me start. Next International is a is a is a is a. We had a company in Nigeria called Next International Nigeria Limited. It's an offshoot of Next International Nigeria. That was Next International UK, which I run as managing director and everything. This company is a UK-based company. It's a brand management company that will. We're representative of companies like Heinz, uh, a, of, a number of multinational companies in West Africa, and I was the CEO. And it's good that I'll tell you the background of how I became governor. I was living in the UK, operating in Nigeria. I was I declared the governor and winner of the election on, on Thursday, 16th of March, 2006. On that day, I was presiding over Fidelity Bank Board meeting as the chairman. And I have members, you can ask this. One of the members is one, somebody who value a lot, uh, um, Bismarck Rwani, was a member of the board. Leighton Dubiskama was a member of the board. Uh, Jara Magoro was a, a former Ondo chairman, was a member of the, I was the chairman. I was presiding over a board meeting, and suddenly, let him do this and said, stop, Mr. Chairman. I said, what? Well, he said, you've been declared the governor of Anambra State. That was on a board meeting. And that was how the meeting stopped. From there, I called, and they said, you have to proceed to Abuja to meet Finec to give you a certificate of return. So I left board meeting, went to the airport, got the next flight, went to Abuja. By 6 p.m. that day, they gave me a certificate of return. And I said to them, I want to go back to Lagos the next day to pack my, to bring my clothes, just clothes, to bring a few things so I can go to Oka for this way. They said, no, 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 that please, you need to proceed to Oka immediately because the then governor, Dr. Chris Singige, because of his circumstances, I've left the country. You know, immediately I was declared, he didn't want, he lost his immunity, so he left through the borders and left out of the country. So there was no government in Anambra State. So that's how the next morning, I moved to Oka. Arrived to Oka, just took a flight to Enugu. Arrived to Oka. As I arrived to Oka, they took me to the chief judge in a small space. He said, This is a form for you to uh, fill, to declare your assets. I filled that form about 30 minutes, whatever I could remember. The next thing I was sworn in as governor. When I finished the swearing in, I asked, Okay, so I'm not sworn in. Where is, does the governor live? They say, Because that time, the governor, governor's lodge was burned down the office. I said, where is the governor, does the governor live? They said, there's no house. Where is his office? There's no office. So what do I do? Any paper, anything? Nothing. 
I managed to get across to somebody who got across the crisis. Who said, there's nothing. So I moved to my village. And that was where I, I stayed there. That was the government. From there, I phoned every company. Let me start with Next International UK. Next International UK, just to show you, I brought this and I'll keep it with you people. Next International UK is a company that is, as at that date, I'm telling you, received over draft from Lloyds Bank of over $7 million. This is a trading company. As at that day, I have over 200 containers on the sea and everything. And I've, seen, I've just been announced governor, and here I'm running a company. So the only thing I could do is to phone my wife. I said, because she was with me, everybody knows in the company, I'm the CEO, she's my deputy with daughter. I said, you take charge. I will never come to London again. See what has happened to me. And I was chairman and director of it. About 11 companies, even in Nigeria, I phoned all of them, said I've resigned. It is from that day that I went to Oka until I was impeached in November, I never left Oka. Not one day. I resigned. You know, and I wonder what, even at times, I even wonder why is there an issue 15 years after I was supposed to resign? So did you, did you, did you did resign you the needful completely? From and did you also put next in your form? Did you, uh, the asset declaration form, did you declare next in there and all You know, when they talk about the declaration of forms, that, what I just saw that, again, I said, what I declared, when you talk about declaration, I just told you a story, Nana. This company is owned by Next Nigeria. Because at times they say, oh, you didn't declare. I said, no, I didn't declare one. I said, sir, with, with people, I didn't declare some assets because those assets have been declared somewhere. So if I declare next Nigeria that I own 5%, I don't have to declare another interest that next Nigeria owns. Just like a, they want to say, I, and I didn't declare something because they were subject of things that were bought from borrowed money. If I come and, if you borrow money from me and buy this suit, when they ask the owner, you have to put remark that you own somebody because it's not your suit. I can come to collect it tomorrow. So what I tell people is that I declare things that belong to Mr. Peter Obi, not even Peter Obi and wife and children. No, because I can tell you, I don't know how other people operate. In my house, my wife will always remind me that this thing belongs to me. It's not your own, no. And my children will do it with emphasis. My daughter will even do it with emphasis. Daddy, we agree that this thing is... So if you want to, let me tell you, when I said that I want to go and do politics, it's not the first thing they will ask me. Daddy, I hope that what you're using to do is your politics is your own money. Don't bring us into it. We are not part of it. So I don't go and decide declaring things that does not belong to you. You declare things. The purpose of assets is to declare. And most of the assets that are declared have been declared somewhere. So you can't declare a company, for example, I own shares in a bank with my name. I declared it. I didn't declare the one say Nest International owes because I've already declared my interest in Nest International. It will amount to double declaration. Well, except that, you know, someone will say in the assets declaration form, you're also required to state the assets, uh, you know, that you jointly own, own, either with your spouse or, you know, that belong to your children. But the question has been that uh, when you set up a trust or a company overseas, do you agree uh, with those who have been alleging that this is strictly for the purpose of tax evasion to avoid or to avoid tax due to the Nigerian government? Ruben, I can tell you, I'm a faithful citizen of anywhere I've passed through. I cannot evade tax. It will never happen. Every investment are done globally is legitimate and pays tax. I just shown a paper I said I live here. If you're a black man in London, you're a suspect. If you're a Nigerian, you're a double suspect. For me to live in the UK, where my bank can write here and say his account has been conducted in an impeccable manner and gives me over seven million dollars overdraft. Ruben, that's all. I pay my taxes. 
If I earn anything in the UK, I pay the UK government their tax. I own a property in London. I pay tax. I cannot come and pay property tax in Nigeria for the property I own in the UK. Money I earn here, I pay tax. Don't forget that I was subject to probe of tax recent, uh, about two years ago in Anambra State. And I showed evidence that in the past 20 years, I've consistently paid my tax and I've never paid less than 50 million naira annually. So I pay my tax. Is that there's, no, there's no issue. It's because maybe, like they expected when they are talking about $500 million and they think it's about tax. No, the tax are duly paid for investment incomes as expected. Nobody, I cannot evade tax. So what about the specific allegation? You've talked about your resignation from Next International. You've talked about your asset declaration. But the specific allegation that you broke the law, that you flouted the, position, the provisions of the Code of Conduct Bureau and Tribunal Act and flouted the Constitution by having foreign accounts. No, Can you address I, that? I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I never did, I didn't, I didn't broke the law. Simple. Everything I did was within the line, and I've told you also the circumstances in which I became governor. You know, everything I did was within the law, and I've told you the circumstances in which I became governor as well. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding, even that there was never a time anybody, anybody, said to me, Peter, come. The, the reason why you see election, when you have election, it takes three months to, for swearing in, is to be able to have orientation. Notwithstanding that I never had any orientation, nobody said to me, you have to do this, you have to do this. But by my own commitment to do the right things, I tried to stay within the law. And I can tell you, I was within the law. What you're seeing now is the situation where, oh, we've looked for everything, even we can't find anything against this man, since he's been, go, like said, since he's going about preaching about saving, preaching about this, let's just throw anything on him. What I was preaching about saving is what I did. I'm always happy when I see Ruben here, because Ruben was part of a government that I participated. The very first day I became governor, the first thing I discussed in my ESCO with my executives is that we must save money. They came up and said, why? I said, listen, as a father, I save money for my ch children. And they know. So I must save money for the children of Anambra State. Even when I was impeached, go and read my impeachment notice. One of the, the, the third point of why I was being rich is saving money without authority of the house. I came back from that impeachment. I said, we must continue saving. As long as I'm here, whenever we receive our FAC allocation, the first thing we do is remove money for pension, remove money for gratuity, remove saving, pay salary, then the rest we can work with. If you don't do it, I'm not part of it. And this you can see everywhere. If you go to Ngozi Wala's book, which you can see, page 61, he showed it there that all the governors, all of us were in a meeting, refused when he was talking about saving. And he said that only Peter will be who argued for saving, was shouted down by his colleagues. It was only Lily Moke that supported me. If you call Sheguna Ganga when he was doing sovereign wealth fund, he would tell you, he's in his own notes, that only Peter will be who supported sovereign wealth fund to be set up and savings. If I have opportunity of being part of Nigeria at the helm, the first law I will take, the first executive bill I will take to the house is that Nigeria must save money. We must have at least 5 to 10 percent of our resources from oil, from mineral resources, from natural resources, save for future generations. Because there's foreign assets. Every country is doing savings. That's why we have a problem whenever, we, because we don't save. You must save money. That's, you must quit your children a better place than you found it. And that includes saving for them. I save for my family, and they know. Okay, so just confirm for me again, as way of housekeeping, 
the five hundred million dollars is a phantom amount. No, no, no. I said if and, I, and if you have one third of that, like you no, said, I didn't say one third. I said if you go there and find more than three percent, more than three percent, about three percent, which is about fifteen thousand million dollars. Okay. If I be good, my children five hundred million dollars. I've cost them. Okay. Yes, money you be good, people. You be, you cost them. Okay. You know, you be put them what is manageable and everything so they can start their life. Okay, so 15, 15 million dollars. I said you, number. if you have something, if Around you, say, if you see anything more than that, confiscate what I have overseas and locally here. Okay, so 15 million dollars. But you always question, you know, President Mohamed Buhari's borrowing. And he, he said in this large budget statement that was the, we pretty much spent our way out of a recession. What, what, what can you say about that? Well, you know, when people said he's a minister, former minister said that they spend their way out of recession. The first thing you do when you have a recession is very simple. You have to cut your cost. You cannot continue to live the same life we lived when things were normal and when you were, of course, not borrowing, when you're borrowing. What is to, what I'm talking about, Boro? Okay, you spent your way out of recession. What did you achieve? Before recession, a bag of rice, for example, is about 12,000 12, naira. We went into recession, and we are not out of recession. It's starting. Leave all this economics. Let's deal with the reality of the ground. Things have changed. So when you say we have come out of recession, what are we? What I said is that if you must borrow when you're in recession to come out, you have to throw the money to critical areas that not just pull you out of recession, but can grow your economy and make it work. The borrowing was thrown away. Can they tell us how it was spent and come out of recession? We're not in America where people can just borrow money to consume and because it's a developed economy. This is an economy that requires critical investment in critical areas and money were borrowed and for consumption. Okay, well, I get the point that uh, you've made about uh, borrowing. You've been very consistent. But on that same occasion, President Muhammad Buhari said the problem is not debt. Uh, that what Nigeria has is a revenue problem and that his administration is committed to ensuring a revenue to GDP ratio of 15%. Uh, do you think that that is achievable? Well, it's not achievable. It's not? It's not achievable. Not at all. Not even in the next five years. I can tell you that. It's not achievable. It's very simple. Ruben, we have a problem, a debt problem. Not revenue problem. We have a debt problem, not revenue problem. You know, don't look at your debt to GDP. Look at your revenue to your debt to your revenue. That is what you should compare. Why do I say it's not achievable in the five years? There's a simple link between pulling people out of poverty and increasing your revenue. It's a simple thing. We're talking about tax revenue everywhere in the world. You cannot have 98 million people in poverty, and you're talking about revenue. Who is going to pay you the tax? Where, where are you going? If you look at, let me give you an example of countries, comparable countries of our size. Philippines today is revenue to GDP of 14.1%. Their unemployment rate is 4%. Vietnam is about 12% to GDP. The unemployment is six. Bangladesh is nine nine percent. The unemployment is six. I can go on and show you countries like that. Indonesia, the unemployment is five. Every country that I've achieved, and this is about 9, 10%. And look at the unemployment, it's below 10. You have unemployment today, unemployment and unemployment of almost 50%, which will even be more when you check that you have 98 million people. The number, the working population of Nigeria is 120 million. 
out of which only 55 is working. So if you want to double this revenue, by the time you put 30 million, half of those you have here, you double the revenue. But if they stay there, you cannot double the revenue. It's a simple thing. Ruben, if you're not working, will you pay tax? You're paying tax because you have a job. Three of you have a job. That's why you can pay tax. In my own village, I can tell you, my village, 70% of the people don't pay tax. They actually live off begging. So why would they pay tax? So it's simple. The more you put people out of poverty, the more you, your revenue increases. Once the economy is growing, the faster the economy, the more you can create revenue for development. That's what happened. And that's why I said, borrowing is not a problem. You can borrow money, but what you use it for? An issue of savings, you can even save when you're borrowing. No way, with a one trillion sovereign wealth fund, one trillion dollar, their debt to GDP is 34. They're borrowing, they're saving. Rush, uh, uh, Japan, with 200 and something debt to GDP, is saving. So if we organize ourselves properly, we can do all these things, pull people out of, create more revenue, invest it properly, and that's it. I was actually looking to quote exactly what the Minister of um, Finance, Budget and Planning said about the 2022 budget as presented. And she said, um, personal costs, debt service and capital expenditure account for 85% of the 2022 budget and there's little scope for cuts in the medium term. What's your response to that? Well, you know, I don't like uh, talking directly about their budget and everything. You know, first is that you have a budget that is skewed towards personal cost, current expenditure. It shouldn't be for a developing economy, you know? And then you talk about borrowing. We, we, we've now agreed that our borrowing is going to be about six trillion, which you're looking at about 30 something percent of, I can tell you it will be worse. In that budget, you see where they even made a provision for putting money into the sinking fund. This year, unless it started yesterday, they've not put any penny into the sinking fund. And they're borrowing more. And they say they're borrowing for infrastructure. And show us, be specific. Specific. Egypt borrowed money to fund Siemens power. Specific. So we know. This money we are borrowing, we are going to give it Siemens because we want them to generate ABC and this. So we know what, or we are giving to those who are generating power so that if we give it to them, they will do this, they will do this. But don't make it look as if, what is talking, I don't know, you know, the minister of government. That's all I can say. I, don't, I just know that things are not the right way. But they're also saying GDP numbers will increase. Any possibility of that based on the fact that when you look at the parameters around? And I also want to ask you about the benchmarks, you know, for this budget. What's your take on the benchmark? The benchmark, the benchmark is reasonable. But what I wanted to see about benchmark is where Nigeria will sign and said, anytime we are both a benchmark, anything we earn goes to sovereign wealth fund. That's so serious. This idea of having a screwed account and lasting this long is what I found very, very annoying. Why can't we have a law that said we must save this amount? Whatever we earn from oil, this amount, this is, this is an asset that is depreciating and diminishing. And one day it will end. Why don't we just have a amount that we throw into, even if it and have a sinking fund protected because this is how we're going to pay this loan. So if you say to me, like the GDP is going to, this GDP thing is there, it's, you can make anything of it. I will know that the GDP is growing. The president promised to pull 100 million in 10 years out of poverty, that's 10 million a year. They haven't done, in, in the past six years, they've thrown more people into poverty. So nobody was pulled out. And now one year to go, he said he would put 100 in 10 years. I can tell you, 
What I want to see is the GDP that will pull one million people out of poverty in the next one year. Let's see people who have come out of poverty. Let's show the critical areas you're investing this money and how it is going to happen and everything. That is what is important. Well, we've been talking about uh, the Pandora Papers, the, uh, <coughs> the economy, budget, and all of that. Let's talk about your state, Anambra, where in the last week or so there have been uh, talks about the likelihood of a state of emergency being declared in uh, Anambra State. Uh, the Attorney General of the Federation saying one thing, the uh, Governor of the state saying another thing, and everyone expressing anxiety about whether or not the gubernatorial election of uh, Anambra State, scheduled for November 6, will be able to hold, particularly as INEC itself is asking for security to be able to conduct that election. Well, a major me, stakeholder. Let me first you tell you that concerns? people yes. in government, when they make statements, should always, first of all, evaluate and think about the implication of their statement to the overall well-being of the country. I said it, and what it is, people don't know that the greatest contributor to GDP growth is intangible assets, which is security, law and order, and even behavior and statements of the leaders. Their statement can actually hurt the economy and hurt the place. So they should always ensure that their words and their statements are something that have gone through scrutiny. Saying that you have to declare state of emergency in Anambra State because of insecurity should actually mean that you need to declare state of emergency in Nigeria. Because if you want to take of this, the declared state of emergency in Anambra because of insecurity, you have to declare state of emergency in Nigeria because of insecurity. So that statement from the Attorney General shouldn't be. Also, he is the Attorney General of the Federation, not the Attorney General of Federal Government or APC. The positions you, you, you are, you're now working for government. Ruben, when you see me come to economic council and everything, or come to advice, economic advisory council, I don't come there as Peter Obi, who is governor of Anambra State. I come as one of those who are leading Nigeria, who is leading one of the sub-nationals that will contribute in building a better Nigeria. And that's how I speak. You don't go and speak at the Attorney General of the Federation, not of federal government, not of APC. Also, I listened to the comments from my governor, who said he did not attend meeting because his colleagues are sponsoring those who are coming to cause problems or kill people in Anambra State. I think that is the reason why he should have gone to the meeting where there was a gathering of those people, plus all the leadership of the Southeast, and look in their face and said, you are the problem. All these things that people will come and grandstand in TV should stop. And I listened to an insensitive statement from him saying that just because 15 people died, that's 15 people includes two professors of medicine. No, I went to, I went to collect Chika Kunyali's calls from the police. And there are so three headless people. We have a country we should be sensitive to one person dying as we are to 20. I said every day, yeah, when people ask me about 2023, I said, you, people are dying in the north every day. Every day I get up. Ruben, I pray for this country and say, God, whatever offense, forgive us. What is happening in the North should be of worry to me as it is to anybody, even when I'm not from there. So, God, 
federal government should not talk about state of emergency. Failure of security in Anambra State is their failure because they are in charge of security. Unless they are saying they are going to declare state of emergency on the country. And everybody knows that. They have to work. All we are asking in Anambra is let's have a free and fair election. Mm. That's all. One person will be governor. I was governor. I was elected twice there. I was the only first person. I never won there. In fact, I didn't know that Anambra would get, ever get at this stage. Nobody saw that coming, but as we only have a few minutes left, what are your thoughts on the same topic on November 6th, the election? And, you know, there's a lot of opinions flying around. Will the elections hold? Will they not hold? Where do you stand on this issue? For me, the elections must hold. There's no reason why the elections won't be, you know. The, yes, the issues of in, problems of insecurity, which is now being, I think, being addressed and under control, if the government wants it to happen, they can put it under control and be able to. And I, I've already called collectively, as I said, that my governor would have attended that meeting and resolved it with his own colleagues in the side. You don't start, instead of start dividing, let us go there and say, this people is coming your own. This is when I was governor, I had a notorious criminal coming from Enugu to operate in Anambra State. I had a notorious criminal coming from Abia, coming from Abia to operate in Anambra State. One from Enugu, is, I call it Gwekelo. This one, they call it Osikanko, from Omaya. Because we were working together, I was able to tell him, me and the new governor agreed. We know the days this man calls for pressure with his gang. And we decided on that day, once he entered an ambassador, they blocked the Enugu. I blocked this place. And Police, as they were chasing him, he had to abandon his cars and everything. I wanted to swim across the, the, the stream, and he was caught. And that was the end of him. Something happened with uh, um, the one from Umaya. The one from Umaya kidnapped this innocent motor. He kidnapped the people that came to work for innocent. We followed him to Umaya with, involved, with cooperation of the government of Abia State. That was the end of it. Even an Anambra person who lived in Omaha, who was operating town in Anambra, he would come and operate and go back to Omaha, called Rofaku. It was so you go and sit down with your colleagues, look in their face and say, Hey, I have a problem. This is coming from your state. I have a, then we can. This is how then they resolve it. The election should go on. Let them use it even as an experiment to do free and fair election. I even transmitting the result electronically. It is all this rigging that is causing problems. If you ask our people to come out, they vote for the person they want, and that's it. Okay. Well, Le okay. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead. Uh, let, let's talk about the PDP matters now. A couple of uh, governors came together and they said they unanimously had a vote and they went one way that the leadership of the party should the chairmanship of the party should go to the north, and invariably what it means is the fact that the presidential ticket will be zoned to the south. But that has been meeting a lot of reactions. Some people are saying that's not cast in stone and the like. And uh, Chief Raymond Dokwasi, a PDP stalwart, came out yesterday and said that the presidential ticket should be zoned to the north. What's your reaction to statements like that? Well, you know, um the highest body of the party, the National Executive Council, has decided from my own, I wasn't, I couldn't, I didn't attend personally, but from what I heard and from what I got at the feedback, that they decided the chairmanship should go to the north. And that the, the presidential candidate uh, ticket should be open to everybody. And that is their position. And that is the position of the party. Everybody has to obey it. I mean, be them party person. Whatever the party decides, we will throw. My commitment is that 
if they say it's by zoning, please, any zone where it is zoned, let's go and find competent person. There must be so. Every zone in this country have competent person that can do the work. Let's find competent person that have capacity, that is visionary enough to pull this country in the right direction. Not to pull it out for the problem, because the problem is the enormous now that you can't pull it out, is to let us start moving in the right direction. Where we are going now, our compass now is pointing in the, we're moving in the wrong direction. Not that anybody, it's not, it's not this government, it's not anybody, it's that we have done the wrong things over the years. So we need to see people who are committed to pulling this country in the right direction, who understands that now we don't have money, we don't have to be doing all sorts of things, we need to cut our costs, we need to do this and everything. Competent person is critical, it is important. If they say it's open, again, let all those who will say or who say they want to be president come out so we can actually start evaluating them. What you see now is that everybody is keeping quiet. I can tell you one of the most, something somebody told me years back that is, uh, not even years back, about a year ago. He said to me, Peter, let me tell you, in this country, they usually don't allow somebody who comes out and talk to be anything because he can be talking. And he gave me an example. Now this man was talking too much. They brought this man. This man was talking to him. They brought this man. And I said, that's the problem. Because we never heard from this man. He just come from the blues. We left Ruben, who we know where he stands. And all of a sudden, we go and take Ruben's brother, you know, John and Batty, who never, we never heard from. And he comes and starts to, at that stage, he didn't promise you anything. He didn't say anything. Because we're avoiding Ruben, whom we know he stand. And people say, oh, Peter, you know, your problem in Alhambra State is that people suffered when you were there. That's why they, everybody's scared that they, if you get to anywhere, nobody will eat anything. I said, what do you mean? When people being paid salary, when people eating and everything, I said, people were eating. Those who suffered or those who wanted to take public money for free, we didn't have money to offer anybody for free. That's why we said, he said, oh, but the one you saved. I said, I saved it because it belonged to the people of Anambra State. Since you know how to save, what about you? How, why are you not putting your heart in the ring for this presidential election? No, well, let's see. Since where... you can run a company that, like you said, good overdraft, you know, you run it successfully, and you always say Nigeria needs a business leader to be able to put things together and someone down the road. Why, why is it not time for you to... Well, we're, we're waiting to see what the party decides. Okay, so you'll be running. What's the no, no, what, when they decide, it is the, when they decide, and we make up our mind and say, we're going to go this direction or this direction. You don't go before the party. I'm a party man. I want to see what the party wants to do. But for me, I will never be part. I said 2023 is critical. This country is collapsing. Economically, all these things we are saying, all these are problems, you see. We, it's an economic problem. If you start pulling people out of poverty, you start reducing all this criminality that you're seeing today. It's happened everywhere from Brazil to Philippines to Bangladesh to Indonesia. The more they pull people out of poverty to Vietnam, the less, and you see it growing. You can't throw people into poverty and think you can go home and sleep. It's simple. Well, Mr. B, I mean, it appears as if uh, this uh, conversation is generating a lot of interest out there. People have been sending in uh, observations and questions. Now, this person says, look, we shouldn't close the Pandora's box yet. So maybe we'll go back to yes. the Pandora papers and no. reopen it. And he's asking that, look, uh, he knows you more as an economist, analyzing the economy, mm. you know, uh, at various fora. Uh, that what business exactly do you do uh, that you can afford to keep maybe $15 million in, the, in an offshore account? Where well, I know what to do, but you no, never know. No, he, he asked a good question. I tell the person, <laughs> let me tell you. Ruben, when I came here, I brought a few things that ordinary is uh, personal to me. I lived in England when they introduced American Express card. 
platinum card. I was living in England where they introduced it. And they said 5,000 people will get it. Those 5,000 people, their card showed charter member. This is my own. Showed their charter member. Member since 1987. Can somebody use it on your behalf? No, so <laughs> I, I, I lived in England, uh, Ruben. I no, lived no, in I know, you don't need to look at it. I, <laughs> Ruben, I lived in England when American Express introduced black card. And they said 1,000 person will be issued with this card. I have it here, so shatter member. To tell you my experience in this card, they told me to go and collect this card somewhere in Sloan Street around Harris. I got there. When I came out from the station, the man who was in the office where I was going to collect it asked me, who are you? And I introduced myself. He said, how did you come? I said, I came from Nice Bridge on Underground. He said, we're Underground? I said, yes, who are you? I called my name. He said, we don't have any any name or card like that here. So I left to go back to the station because what I use in England, everybody knows it's on the ground. I was going back to the station when my bank manager called me and said, Peter, go back there. I think they found the card. What shocked me is how can this man come from underground to collect this card that everybody have come to collect Rose Rose on this one? Ruben had a viable business. If anything, politics, I'm not regretting. Because everywhere I found myself is grace of God. That's why when I went into the same politics, when people say this person is doing this person, I say, listen, I came here by grace of God, I won't abuse it. Otherwise, if there's anything to regret in my life, it's going into politics. Because it made me poorer. But however, I'm glad that God allowed me to also make me. Make a success of it. Mr. B, maybe so you have to be the more business specific. I'm doing. How no, no. Did, what kind of business? I'm telling how you. How did you make the money? I'm telling you now. The business I'm doing is that I was a brand and market management company that I run. I had a Heinz franchise. You can go and look. I was the sole importer of Heinz, salad cream, big beans. Just to give you an example of one company. South African breweries, who is the international breweries? I was their sole engineer. I can go on and on. I was working, bringing the over team for Novartis with a co another company. When I can go on and on and everything. If I had to tell you what the company is, the company I was involved before, when I left and my brother took it over and paid me off, sort of became Nest Cash and Carry that you see in Abuja and God now. So it's the same company. I was a trader. Everybody knows I was a very big trader. Even chairman will tell you. Chairman knew I used to import wine and he used to send him champagne. He will tell you that. When he was in Surrey, when all of us were still at the struggling stage. <laughs> so I had a viable business. But went into banking. So if the person wants to know, I was sitting on the board of three banks, could be chairman one before I became governor. So that is also a business. So you have shares in those banks too? Major shares. Major shares in those banks? Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Peter Obi, for joining us uh, this morning. I'm sure that, uh, you know, this conversation will still generate more conversations out there. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.